الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب recite aloud salawat respected brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Thousands of years ago, in the region of the Middle East and North Africa, for seven years in a row, there was a drought. There was shortage of food, there was no wheat or other crops, and people lived in difficulty. However, in Egypt at that time, not only did they have sufficient food, but they in fact had surplus food. And they could sell it to other nations. And that was due to the planning done by Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, who is mentioned in the Quran by the name Yusuf. At the same time, in Canaan, where Prophet Joseph, uh, Joseph's father, Prophet Jacob, peace be upon him, used to live with his sons and grandchildren, sons and daughters and grandchildren, they had shortage of food. So the sons of Prophet Jacob, peace be upon him, went to Egypt to buy wheat. And then they ended up in the same country, the country managed by... How they had thrown Prophet Joseph into the well, how he was taken out of the well, how he was sold as a slave and how he went through different times, good times and difficult times and eventually became the king in Egypt. So they went there and they met Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him. They went there twice. They spent time with Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him. They had food with him. They spoke with him, but they did not recognize their own brother. However, Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, recognized each and every one of them. And the story continues. But I'm going to stop it here. What does this story have to do with the lecture today? Actually, there is a man on earth who many people might have met, might have spoken with, might have got help from, and they do not recognize him, but he recognizes everyone, including you all and me. And that is why one of his names is Yusuf of Zahra. And he is the Imam of our time, for whose return and reappearance we pray every day. But have we given a thought to the prayer we recite every day. Do we really long for his return? Who longs for Imam Al Mahdi? That is the topic of this lecture. Recite a loud salawat. Oh.
Who longs for the Imam of our time? That is the topic of this lecture. So what you are going to learn in the next 50 or so minutes is the following. Number one, what is the need of an Imam? Number two, what does it mean to wait for the Imam? Number three, what does it entail to wait for the Imam? Number four, when is the waiting going to end? And after that, I will start to wrap up this lecture and give the historical accounts of some of the events that took place on the day of Ashura and also recite the eulogy for one of the members of the family of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So before I proceed, please recite a loud salawat. In the beginning, I recited a part of Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the holy book that this book is guidance for the muttaqeen, for the pious people, those who believe in the unseen. Those who believe in the unseen. They believe in an unseen God. They believe in the unseen angels. They believe in unseen paradise. They believe in unseen hell and so on. However, when we look at the classical exegesis of the Holy Quran, the hadith based exegesis of the Holy Quran, we see that the Imam says, Imam Sadiq peace be upon him says, that here it ghayb, believing in ghayb, believing in the unseen means those who believe in Imam Al Mahdi, peace be upon him. So we all believe in the Imam, but do we really understand why? What is the need to have the Imam? And people ask me, and people ask in general, and I know some people in person who have started to have doubts about the Imam. And they ask, what is the, if I may use this word, what is the utility, what is the purpose of an Imam that is unseen, that is, who is hidden? What's the point? That is a question that many people have in their minds. But some people dare to ask this question. So there are hadith that say that in the end of times, many Shia would start to doubt whether the Imam exists. In order to answer this question, the need for the Imam, we have to get back to the basics. And the basic principles, some of which I have been explaining throughout this series of lectures. One of those principles is that Allah's sunnah never changes. This first part of the lecture is going to be about the basics, which is very important. And as we proceed about waiting, what entails waiting and so on, it is going to be a little bit lighter. But we have to get through this basic stuff to understand the concept of the imam, the need for the imam. The sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ever changes. The way he works never ever changes. فَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا So you shall never ever find any change in the sunnah, the method of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of his sunnah is that he always keeps one representative on the earth one of his representatives one representative when he created the first human being adam peace be upon him he made him his khalifa he made him his caliph he said i'm going to send my khalifa on earth i'm going to make him my khalifa 
my caliph, my representative on the earth. That is the verse of the Holy Quran. There were no other human beings. The first one was his representative, which means as long as there are human beings on the earth, there is going to be always and always one Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people might say, well, there were human beings before Adam, peace be upon him, human-like creatures. That is not the main topic, but I can make a point. It might very well be, and there were Neanderthals and others. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We certainly have created man in best of stature. The best of stature means the one that has intellect. Intellect. There could be creatures looking like human beings before, but they did not have that kind of intellect that Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, had. So making this point moving forward, there is always and always going to be one representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth as long as there are human beings. And that representative does not always have to be a prophet, does not always have to bring a sharia, does not always have to bring a holy scripture, and he does not have to receive revelations. That is one logical reasoning that we believe that we need one representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth, whether we can see that representative or not. But then the question is still there. Okay, why? Why do we need that? As I explained, this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his way of working is that we cannot always see what the imam does. However, we have got the clues from the hadith, what he does. And we have it in the Quran. The imam said, Sheikh Saduq has written it in his famous book, Kamaluddin wa Tamamun Na'ma. That the imam said, you should always argue and debate with the, those who oppose Imama, your opponents, with Surah Al Qadr. Surah Al Qadr, it's a powerful surah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ In that night, the night of power, Laylatul Qadr, the angels and the ruh, that is also a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for simplicity's sake, we say, all the angels descend. They descend carrying the orders. Okay, and then what? They carry the orders, and then what? There is a secret in this, in this surah, in this verse. Therefore, the imam has said, you should have this surah. You should use this surah when you debate and argue with those who do not accept the imama, who do not accept the imam of our time. Tanazzalul malaika. It is going to be a little bit academic and I'll quickly go through this point, this phase of this lecture. Tanazzal, tanazzul, nazil, tanzil, nazzala. All these words have same root. And they point to the fact that something is being descended. Descended to something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the same word for Quran. Quran was nuzul of Quran. Tanzil of Quran. When it this was descended, it had a receiver. It was received by the Holy Prophet. The same word is used for rain. When rain descends, it is received by the earth by the valleys, by the plants. When the angels descend, who are they received by? What do they do when they descend in the night of power? What do they do? Who, they, who do they meet? That is the question. What do they do? And then we have hadiths, several hadiths in which is, it is explained what do they do. One interpretation is that, they bring the interpretation of those verses of the Quran which are relevant for the next year and they tell the Imam of our times 
those interpretations. And they bring other orders to the Imam that he carries out. What are those orders? We do not know. It's beyond our capacity. It's beyond our scope. What are those orders? We don't know. Recite a salawat. We do not know about those orders. But what we do know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give the power to his representatives and also give them a very long life. Because some people say, how can a man be alive for 1400 years, 1250 years? Well, is it impossible? Can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that? When Prophet uh, Yunus, peace be upon him, went into the belly of a big fish, which some people believe was whale or whatever creature, the Holy Quran says that we would have kept him until the day of judgment if he did not speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he did not repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We would have kept him in that, in that place until the day of judgment. So he would have kept that fish alive for until thousands of years and the prophet inside inside that fish so if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that can't he keep our imam alive for 1400 years 2000 years 3000 years he can that is absolutely no problem these are some of the uh, objections to the concept of uh, the imam of our time the the mahdawiyah to believe in the mahdi these are some of the objections we get to hear and unfortunately many people have doubts they start to have doubts about the Imam and that is what is very important to work on and remind ourselves that we do have an Imam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can keep him alive for a very long time and it is needed and it is necessary it is Allah's sunnah to keep one representative on earth and we have the hadith that says that if the earth is empty of Allah's representative it will implode it would cease to exist why it would cease to exist you remember we did that mental exercise the other day and I pointed to it yesterday as well when you imagine something and you create a scenery, you create a lion, you create a tree, you create a human being, you create anything in your imagination. As long as you have your focus on that thing, it continues to exist. As soon as you take away your focus, you take away your focus, it ceases to exist. The Imam is the focal point of existence. If there is no Imam, then this existence would seem to exist. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps his representative on earth all the time. And there are details about this concept, but I will move forward. And we need to learn about this. We have to have in-depth understanding of the concept and the need of the Imam. But I have to move forward. The other thing, what does the Imam do? The Imam pulls the people, in particular the believers, out of the darknesses into the light. My very first lecture was about moving out of the darknesses into the light. I'll tell you, um, personal anecdote about this concept moving out of the light into the darknesses and what does it have to do with the Imam let me tell you and explain it to you with the help of a personal anecdote but before I do that please recite a loud salawat earlier this year I was in Qom and I went um, to the shrine of Lady Fatima Masuma, peace be upon her. And I was supposed to meet there for the first time one of my teachers to be. Uh, someone who is a very learned man, uh, who is a specialist 
in philosophy, in uh, tafsir, in uh, fiqh, and several different Islamic sciences. And his name is Zanjir Zan. He is Iranian. Zanjir Zan Husseini is his name. He is not very well known. He's anonymous type. And I was sitting there in the, the court of the, uh, of the shrine in front of Masjid Azam. And then he came there and uh, we sat together and I had a few questions. And I said to him, about this verse that Allah is the wali of the believers and he pulls them out of the darknesses, brings them out of the darknesses into the light. And this verse, I believe, I said to him, I believe has many deeper meanings and it is related to our Imam. And he said, yeah, continue. And I told him and I said, I think this verse is valid as long as there is Quran. And the Holy Prophet used to pull the believers and all the human beings out of the darknesses into the light. But after the Holy Prophet, Allah is remaining the wali. Allah is the wali. The verse is going to be there. People are going to be there in the darknesses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a body. He is not limited. He does not have hands that he will by hand pull people out. His sunnah is that he works with through causes and effects, through wasila. This is his sunnah. So who is going to pull people, in particular the believers, out of the darknesses? The darkness is related to wrong beliefs. The darkness is related to bad actions. The darkness is related to bad ethics. Who is going to pull the believers out of the darknesses after the Holy Prophet? It is going to be the Imams who will not bring any new Sharia, will not bring any new Holy Scriptures. They are not going to bring any new book, but with the knowledge they inherit from the Holy Prophet, they will continue to pull the believers out of the darknesses into the light. Until we have the Quran, until we have the believers until we have the human beings on earth there is the need for a wali on the earth who is going to represent and manifest and reflect Allah's walaya on the earth and keep pulling people out of the darknesses into the light whether we can see him or we cannot when I tell my teacher that, he said, you should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave you this idea because this is indeed what it means. This is indeed what it means. And Allah matabatawai, may Allah be pleased with him. One of the greatest, if not the greatest exegete and mufassir of the history of Islam and who has influenced me greatly. He writes in his famous book, landmark book, Shia in Islam in which he explains the Islamic theology and different aspects of Islamic theology in which he says that the Imam of our time with the permission of Allah and with the powers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to him can even have access to our hearts. He can even change our hearts. So sometimes people are being pulled out of the darknesses into the light because the Imam has a special sight. He has a special look on that person. Some people think this is, uh, these things are myth. These things are stories. But they are not. If we ponder in the Quran, there are hadiths, there are countless hadiths about Imam of the Imam of our time and also in the Sunni sources even there are at least two narrations in the Sunni sources that say that the Imam of our time that the Imam al-Mahdi is the son of Hassan al-Askari even in the Sunni sources and that has been documented in the books like by Shaykh al-Qurani Asr al-Zuhur which is a very famous book about the end of times and the reappearance of the Imam. So we need to learn about our Imam. We need to learn about the need to have an Imam. We need to learn about the powers of our Imam. And we need to learn 
but that why do we have to wait for the Imam? Why? And that brings me to question number two. Why wait for the Imam? Before I proceed, please recite a loud salawat. There is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put inside all of all of us, whether Muslims, non-Muslims, men, women. Everyone has something inside him or her. What is that? That is the love for justice. That is the love for justice. Everyone by nature loves justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة أن يحسب الإنسان أن لن نجمع عظامة I do not swear by the day of judgment which means I swear by the day of judgment it's a great thing by the day of judgment and I do not swear by the نفس اللوامة the admonishing نفس does the human being does man think that we are not going to gather his bones, we are not going to resurrect him on the day of judgment. Here there is a point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears first by the day of judgment, after that by the admonishing nafs. What do the two have what the two have to do with each other? The exegetes say first Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Yawmul Qiyamah the day of judgment when justice will be served pure justice will be served divine justice will be served after that immediately after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the admonishing nafs the conscience inside us that is a little judge sitting inside us that is justice driven that loves justice and they believe and they say that there is a little qiyam, little day of judgment going on inside us all the time. That tells us what is right, what is wrong. That nafsul lawama, the admonishing nafs, keeps telling us that we have to love justice. We have to be just. So the love for justice is inside everyone. And throughout the history, human beings have been pinning their hopes on individuals to serve justice, to establish justice. In the ancient times, people, the tribal people, used to pin their hopes on tribal chiefs, that they would serve justice, they would establish justice in the tribe or in the region. Then after that, people started to pin their hopes on dukes, and princes and kings and queens that they would serve justice, establish justice. And then after the emergence of a nation state and democracy, people started to pin their hopes on prime ministers and presidents that they would serve justice and justice would be established in their countries. And then people also, some people naively believe that United Nations is going to help establish justice on earth. And some people look up to their religious leaders that they are going to establish justice in their territories or in the world eventually. But we see that all those hopes were false. There is no justice. Just us. No justice, because only a just representative of a just God can establish justice in the purest form on earth. Only a just representative of God. But this does not mean that we should not try and establish justice in our communities, in our cities, in our countries, in our regions and try for it on a global level. In fact, many people, many people, Muslims or non-Muslims, they try to establish justice because of that, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put inside us all. 
Sometimes they have, they form groups, human rights groups, uh, minority rights groups, uh, environmental groups, and groups to, uh, to, to combat climate change, and also groups for the rights of people who live a sinful life. Also for those, without spelling it out. But all these people truly and genuinely believe that what they are doing is justice. They are working for justice. Even if they are defending the rights of those who, according to our belief, are living a sinful life. This means that this justice is in our fitrah, in our nature. We can misunderstand it. We can mistakenly think that what we are doing is working for justice while actually working for injustice. That is another story. That is our misunderstanding. That is the mistake we make. But still, the basic thing inside us is that we love justice. And therefore, we are waiting for the Imam that he will return, reappear, and establish justice on the earth. Not in my Husseinia, not in a Muslim country, not in a Muslim region, for the whole humanity. He would establish justice on the earth. That is why we are waiting for him. But waiting means that we are waiting for some changes to occur. When you wait for something, you say, I'm waiting for him or her, waiting for this thing to happen. You are waiting for the status quo to, cha to change. Do you really want the status quo to change? Does the current state of affairs of this world bother you? Does it bother you that billions of people live without access to clean water or health services or access to electricity in this world? Does it bother you that many people are being killed in senseless wars and tribal wars in Africa? Does it bother you that children in Yemen are found clinging to the dead bodies of their fathers killed in a war imposed on them by the Saudi Arabia? Does it bother you that Muslims in China are being terribly oppressed and deprived of their basic human rights? Does it bother you that people in countries like places like Palestine, Kashmir, Myanmar are being killed, oppressed. Does it bother you that people, Sunni Muslims in Myanmar, have to flee to save not only their lives, but also because there is a real danger that their women will be raped? Does it bother you that migrants in their attempts to reach the shores of Europe drown? on regular basis? Does it bother you that the corporate you work for has looted and plundered the resources of many African countries and has left a huge footprint behind? Does it bother you that Amazon is burning? Does it bother you that Arctic is melting? And there are many other questions. If none of this bothers you because you have a good life, you have a car, you have a house, you say prayers five times a day. You fast in the month of Ramadan and you also go on Hajj from time to time and also you go on the Ziyara and Ziyara of Arba'een each year and you pay Zakat and you pay Khums and you are living happily. You will go to heaven. You do not need the Imam. Why would you like to change the status quo? Why?
recite the salawat In order to really wait for the Imam, we have to understand that the Imam has a global vision and we have to also develop a global vision. Not only concerned with Shia Muslims, not with Sunni Muslims, not with Muslims. We have to think about the humanity on a global level. And of course, we have to be concerned with the affairs of the Muslim Ummah first of all but as they say in corporates think globally act locally we have to think globally but we have to act locally when it comes to waiting for the Imam and what do we have to do what does it entail to wait for the Imam what does it entail Let's ask the Amirul Mu'mineen who has given the key, the answer to this question. The Amirul Mu'mineen has said, لا يحمل هذا العلم إلا أهل الصبر أهل البصر والصبر No one can carry this flag except those who have Basr and Sabr. Let me explain this with the help of an example. We have alams, flags that we carry in the processions, sometimes also in our congregations. And when they are heavy, they have to be carried with two arms. You cannot carry them with one arm. You need two physical arms. In order to carry the flag of truth, in order to carry the flag of justice, in order to carry the flag of Tawheed, which is the flag of the Imam of our time. You also have to have two spiritual arms. We have to have two spiritual arms. We can also be flag bearer of the Imam before he arrives and after his reappearance through those two spiritual arms. The Amir al muminin has told us Basr and Sabr. What is Basr? Basr is wisdom. Wisdom to tell the right from the wrong. Wisdom to tell the truth from the falsehood. Wisdom to tell the oppressed from the oppressor. That is Basr. By not becoming a victim to the mainstream media. By not being a superficial Muslim. By looking at the depth of things, that is basr, that is extremely important. Otherwise, people can come and deceive us as community, as individual believers. That is wisdom. That is a topic in itself. That is a topic in itself. And we have limited time. But just making the point, the second spiritual arm is sabr, patience. What is patience? Again, let's ask the Holy Prophet. The Holy Prophet has said that sabr is of three types. When it comes to the acts of worship, being patient. Sabr, doing acts of the acts of worship. We have to be patient about it. Number two, when it comes to musibah, calamities, troubles in life, we have to be patient there. Number three, when it comes to sinning, we have to be patient there and not give in to the temptations. We have to have the wisdom and the patience if we want to carry this flag, if we really and truly want to wait for the return of the Imam. Without these things, all those slogans, all those anti-this, anti-that slogans, all those processions, all those demonstrations have no meaning. Just a pastime activity, just a fun activity. I met a scholar who can see the realities, who is a teacher of ethics. He's an unknown person. 
And one day he said, you know, you can burn as many flags as you want. And I personally do not think that burning flags has any utility or place in the 21st century. You do not have to burn the flags of nation states. You have to burn the ideologies. You have to give your own narrative. You have to burn others' narratives. What can you achieve by burning the flags anyway? He said, you can burn as many flags as you want, but as long as you have not burnt the flag of your own nafs, it is all of no use. And that statement, that saying has just stayed with me. All those slogans, working for the Imam, working for the justice, but being unjust in my own home, being unjust in my own community. What is the purpose of all that action, all that activism, when I cannot be just to my own family, to my own wife, to my own husband, to my own children, when I am all night busy, all day busy in political activism on Facebook and my child is crying, crying for attention, but I am all too busy to curse Israel online. I don't have time for my wife. I don't have time for my children. What about that? We have to start from small, small things. If we want to build this up, we have to first of all, Stop being unjust to ourselves, to our families, to our communities. Recite aloud salawat. This brings me to the next question. When is the waiting going to end? When is the Imam going to reappear? And I have the answer. I have the answer and I'm going to tell you. And the answer is, no one knows. That is the answer. There are many people who try to estimate and say the Imam is going to appear in so and so many years. All the signs that we see in the Middle East, they all point to the fact that the reappearance is very near. We have had those people throughout the history who derive immense pleasure from estimating the time of the reappearance. However, since they know that the Imams, that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, have condemned those and called them liars who are going to set the time, who are going to tell the time of the reappearance. So people have become smart. They say, I did not say he is going to appear on the same year, same this day, this year, this, this. However, he is going to appear in the next so many decades. He is going to appear. That Ayatollah said that so many old people are going to see the Imam. Isn't that pretty much close to estimating the time of the return? While the hadith says, several Imams and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, have said, Liars are those who set the time of reappearance. No one really knows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows when this is going to happen. This is not our job to seek those pleasures, pastime activity. Oh yeah, yeah, sitting in your cozy homes in New York, Toronto, London, Scotland, Aberdeen, Oslo, Amsterdam, in Australia, New Zealand, Pakistan, India. And then you eat a plate of biryani and you sip a cup of tea and you zap channels and you look at the Syria war, you look at the Yemen war and you say, this points to Sufiani. I'm sure. You see, the Imam is going to return very soon. Bring another plate of biryani. That pastime, pleasure, funny stuff. This is serious matter. This is the future of the humanity. And there are people who would just say, 
and it was there was a hype about it about a decade ago and there has been hype on and off since the last three four decades because of the things that have happened in the Middle East in particular after the uh, the revolution in Iran and after that because that was a great event in the Middle East and after that the Iraq war first Iraq war second Iraq war the now the the war in Yemen then the the war in Syria the emergence of Daesh and then the political uh, situation in Hejaz in Saudi Arabia and people started to saying that Sayyid is Sayyid Al Khurasani Maulana how do you know that have you received a revelation the Imam has told you that Sayyid is Sayyid Al Yamani maybe maybe that is yeah it points to the fact that he is how do you know who has told you did that Sayyid ever say that or that Sayyid actually curbs such notions such an irresponsible behavior by people can be scholars and non-scholars when some simple minded people start to believe that yeah that Sayyid is Sayyid Al Khurasani or Al Jamani and truly start to believe that the appearance the reappearance is very near and then it does not happen in five years time ten years time and the person they thought was Sayyid Al Khurasani passes away they thought the person was Sayyid Al Jamani passes away and then the reappearance does not happen the guy has sold his house the guy did not make any planning there could be simple people they say the Imam is going to reappear soon this whole Tahuti system is going to be destroyed yeah this whole interest-based econ economic system is going to be destroyed yeah I don't want anything to do with this stupid system unjust system the appearance is going to happen in the next five years because the Maulana said if some simple-minded person does that and it does not happen so what will people do they will gradually start to leave this belief they will s gradually start to say yeah these are all myths excuse me Maulana these are all myths that's why the hadith continues and those who hurried in this matter they were destroyed they would be destroyed they would go after those false magician sort of people whose job is to just create illusions for people I am the representative of the Imam the Imam is coming soon and those people are appearing in Iraq I am the representative of Al Jamani just follow me the Imam has told me to go to such and such group and tell that I am coming soon I'm going to return soon those people and then people would probably give their lives for those frauds those false claimants of either the Imam or claiming that they are the Imam or the representatives of the Imam they were destroyed there is a narration it's a beautiful I find it very beautiful about not hurrying in this matter I'm going to tell you that narration before I do that, please recite a loud salawat. It is, uh, it is included in um, the books about the reappearance in the end of times. This narration says that after the reappearance of the Imam, many people would have joined him. Many Sayyids and non-Sayyids, his companions would have joined him until they would reach a place in Iraq and there would be a Sayyid sitting there and he would say are you really really the Imam if you're really the Imam show me the letter that the Holy Prophet had written people would say oh how dare you how how dare you challenge the Imam his companions would say but the Imam would say no 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 leave him that Sayyid would be a really brave man you really have to have guts to stand up and challenge but that man would want to be 100% sure so the Imam would take out the letter and show it to him at that moment that Sayyid would kiss on the forehead of the Imam that person was would be very very careful he wanted to 100%
make sure that this person is the Imam indeed. So what we need to learn is to be patient. We have to work on ourselves. We do not have to hurry. We do what the Amir al-Mu'mineen has told us. That we have to have wisdom and we have to have patience. And the hadith continues. The hadith says, وَنَجَلْ muslimun," And those will get salvation who are muslimun. Not Muslims. Muslimun here comes from taslim. Taslim means who submits to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who does not start complaining, oh I cannot wait, I cannot wait. The appearance, the reappearance must occur now. No. Submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It may happen in my lifetime. It may happen in the lifetime of my children. It may happen in the lifetime of my grandchildren. It's not my wazifa. It's not compulsory, obligatory upon me. This is not my job. This is a job of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My job is to be good, to be wise, to be patient, to help the oppressed people and oppose the oppressors. And again, start locally. Join anti-racism organizations. For example, join minority rights organizations. Join those organizations uh, that help uh, fight Islamophobia. And so on. It doesn't... Oppression, wherever we see oppression. The Amir al-Mu'mineen said that be the friend of the oppressed and the enemy of the oppressor. The Amir al-Mu'mineen never said be the friend of the oppressed who is Muslim. The Amir al-Mu'mineen said, be the friend of the oppressed and be the enemy of the oppressor even if uh, he or she is apparently Muslim. Just oppose the oppressor. In the government of the Amir al-Mu'mineen, there was such a justice that it is said, one day the Amir al-Mu'mineen heard that some robbers robbed a Jewish family in one part of his government, one place that was under his jurisdiction in the Islamic government. And they robbed the Jewish woman of one anklet, some ornament she used to wear. The Imam said something that is remarkable. The Imam said that if a believer hears this news and dies out of grief, he should not be blamed. Just a Jewish woman was robbed, one anklet. Some robbers took it away from her. In Ali's government, That is the kind of justice our Imam is going to establish on the earth. And only he can do that. And the way this earth is being filled with injustices, that reminds us of the hadith of the Holy Prophet, that the Imam, the last Imam, will fill the earth with justice the same way it would have been filled with injustices. And this Azadari, this Muharram, is closely linked with the Imam. Why? Because what Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, started, what the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, started, and after him, what Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, started the mission to accomplish justice, that will be completed by the Imam of our time. And when he reappears, he will also avenge the blood of her, of his grandfather, Hussein. Therefore, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, said to Imam Sajjad, O oh my son Ali, my wrongfully spilled blood is not going to be forgotten or forgiven until the Mahdi reappears. 
the blood of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, was spilled. Not only his blood, his companions, his family members, the sons of Hassan, the sons of Abbas, brothers of Abbas, and the sons of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. When all the companions had been martyred, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, sent his own son into the battlefield as the first person from the Ahlul Bayt to become a martyr in Karbala, Ali al-Akbar. But he also had a son who was Ali al-Asughar. He was only six months old. Six months old. It is written in the books of Maqtal that when all the companions and all the family members of Imam Hussein, the men of Bani Hashim, were martyred, he was left alone. Imam Sajjad was ill inside a tent and there were women inside the tents and there were children thirsty crying out Al-Atash Al-Atash Imam Hussein peace be upon him was outside the tents he looked to the right there is no one to help him looks to the left there is no one to help him it is written in the books of Maqtal. At that moment, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, called out loud, Is there a monotheist who is going to help the family of the Messenger of Allah for the sake of reward from Allah? No one replies. The women hear the sound. They hear the call of the Imam Hussein. They start to lament. Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, went to the tents. It is written in the books of Maqtal that Lady Zainab, peace be upon her, brought forward Asghar, said to Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, Brother, he's at the verge of dying. Please find some water for him. Rukhaya is worried. Rukhaya says, My brother Asghar does not make any sound. His face is pale. His eyes are closed. Imam Hussain takes Asghar on his arms and goes to the battlefield. Imam Hussain says to the accursed men, of Ibn Ziyad's army. If you have no mercy on me, at least have some mercy on this infant. He needs some water. Give him some water. He is at the verge of dying. It is written that even some accursed men started to weep. They were moved. At that moment, one accursed man said, Iqta' kalam al Hussein. Cut the speech of Hussein. Hurmala. He is going to cut the speech of Imam Hussein. Hurmala fixed a three pronged arrow in his bow and aimed at Imam Hussein. Karbala has witnessed a lot. Karbala is going to witness a lot. But now Karbala is going to witness something that the earth has not witnessed in its history. Hurmala aims at Imam Hussain, shoots the arrow. The arrow pierces through the neck of Ali al Asghar.
His blood falls on the arms of Imam Hussein. Little Asghar has been martyred right away. At that moment of calamity, the son of Ali, the son of Zahra, the grandson of the Holy Prophet says, Every calamity is easy upon me. If Allah is the beholder, but what to do with the body of Asghar? It is heavy for Hussein. Such a light body is heavy for him. Qasim's body was heavy. Akbar's body was heavy. But Asghar's body is the heaviest. He cannot carry it to the tents. So what to do? The Imam digs a grave, buries Asghar in the grave. It is written in a book of Maqtal that at that moment Imam Hussein heard a sound. Hussein, do not worry, there is a maid in heaven waiting for Asghar. And perhaps at that time, Lady Asya in heaven would have said, Do not worry, Hussein. And perhaps Lady Hagar and Lady Sarah in heaven would have said, Do not worry, Hussein. And perhaps Lady Khadija in heaven would have said, Do not worry, Hussein. And perhaps Lady Fatima in heaven would have said to her Hussein, do not worry Hussein. And they all would have said to Asghar, Asghar, come over here, come over here. We are going to take care of you. We are going to take care of you. Allah, la'natullahi ala al-qawm al ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم ولعن عدوهم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته